Hello to everyone watching this footage. It's Leviathan here again, and I've got another storyline that might be quite exhilarating to you guys because it's a full feature length storyline with like four pages, I believe. It's about a showdown between Dentrony and the dominant ruler of the planet Mars, known simply as Mars. So bear with me as I read the storyline, and hopefully you guys could tag along and such. Here we go. Dense Journey number two. Mars, created and copyrighted by Levi Corsi Ames, July 16th, 2015. To begin the story, we travel to the suburbs of New York until we start noticing a seemingly average house as we see a late adolescent woman getting the mail. She has red contacts, dyed purple hair, and was dressed in her personal style of gothic clothes. Her name is Ebony Anthaway. After noticing an envelope in the mail, she got extremely excited as she went back in her house. She then got to the kitchen where she told her middle-aged parents, Mom, Dad, I got a letter from Dr. Betty Trevers of the Paranormal Defense. And they all huddled together to see it. Ebony started reading. Dear Ebony Anthaway, I have heard about your pyrokinetic powers and decided to make your greatest dreams come true. By tomorrow, you will pack up and leave to the PD headquarters, where you will live and become allies with my daughter Denstrini. From that point on, your life will never again be the same. Sincerely, Dr. Betty Trevers of the Paranormal Defense. And P.S. You shall now be known as Ignitia. And her mother said, Well, that's wonderful, Ebony. You've been hired to be the sidekick of your greatest idol? I know, she said in excitement. They then went into the living room and pulled out a scrapbook about all of Ebony's greatest memories. In a flashback, Ebony had gained her powers for the first time by saving a kid from being pounded by a murderous bully when she was 10 years old. In another flashback, Ebony was joining a gate a day camp when it started raining hard and made it hard to make a campfire. And with her power, she made a campfire that was waterproof. Such a whole lot of memories, sweetheart. And now you will have the best job there is for you, her father said. When it was time to go to bed, Ebony went back into her bedroom for the last time, which was filled with merchandise of Denstrini, and went straight to bed. The next morning, Ebony packed her bag said goodbye to her parents, and teleported to the front gates of the Paranormal Defense Headquarters. After going through security, she met Dr. Trevors. She has eight hazel eyes, blonde hair and a short bob, was wearing laboratory clothes, and was in her late 70s. Welcome to your new home, Ignitia. It's great to be here, Dr. Trevors. Can you show me around? She then asked. Certainly, Dr. Trevors replied as they walked in. After two hours of the tour, Betty took Ignitia to a room with a sign on the door saying, Denstrini's Quarters. Well, Ignitia, Betty said to Ebony, it's time for you to meet my daughter. She then opened the door, and they see Denstrini watching the news on a series of monitors. In her stone hand, she was holding her favorite chocolate bar, which was the first human food she ever ate. And her left hand was holding a half-full bottle of moonshine. There was hardcore rock music playing on the radio nearby as a way for her to multitask. When they got in, Ignitia lost control and started giving Debbie a bear hug. It's you! I just couldn't wait to meet you, Deborah! She said in excitement. Oh, uh, mother, who is this? She then asked. Debbie, this is your new sidekick like I've told you about. Don't you remember? Um, honestly, Mother, I think I was spacing out back then. Fine with that, Dr. Trevors finally said. I've got to complete some work now. Ignitia, how about you start having your first conversations with Debbie, okay? You betcha, Ebony finally said as Betty left the room. She then got out of the bear hug and started staring at her demonic idol, which made Den's journey a bit annoyed. After 20 seconds of awkward silence, she finally asked her new sidekick, Well, why did my mother hire you? When I was 10 years old, I developed some pyrokinesis, which made a grand change to my life. 
I've got a series of stories about that, but telling them all might make you bored after a while. Okay, then. Well, do you want some moonshine? Debbie asked as she handed the bottle to Ignitia. Sorry, I don't have a healing factor. Other than that, my main weakness is I suffer from positivity overload, which would probably make others around me feel a bit disturbed. But I promise not to do that too much around you. Thank you, Ignitia, replied Denshini, still feeling a bit annoyed. Meanwhile, below the surface of the planet Mars, the insectoid Martians were minding their own business in their underground cities as we start traveling to the capital building of the planet. In the throne room, the female Martianoid Mars is examining our planet through a monitor and altering the screen with a control desk. She has red eyes, red hair, and is literally a cyborg, with her official feature of her manufactured anatomy being her three-fingered right arm. She was created by an earlier Martian scientist to prove that technology is more superior compared to natural incarnations of astrophysics in terms of leadership in warfare. While examining the Earth, she located her first human target, Dr. Betty Trevers, on her mission of taking down the current CEO of the Paranormal Defense. Dr. Trevor seems to be far too simple for the Queen of the Red Planet. This objective will be nothing but Larva's play. She then enables a microphone, calling to her people, saying, Prepare the transporter ships. We've got to annihilate Dr. Betty Trevers as our first plan to rescue our people from overpopulation. Start the ships for flight in ten minutes, and she disabled the microphone. Back on Earth, Denstrini, Ignitia, and some PD workers arrived at the western coast of the Nile River for a new objective. What are we doing here, Debbie? Ebony asked her partner. My mother said that there seems to be an unidentifiable organism hiding in this river that's messing with the local supply of fish. We have to track it down and take it back to the HQ. Ignitia, said a random worker, can you come see this? We're having a bit of a problem with our soda supply. Apparently, they brought a soda supply to keep from getting dehydrated in the Sahara Desert. As Ebony went to help them, Debbie decided to take a smoke from a well-fitted cigar. Since Debbie is half-demon, she's virtually immortal, which makes drugs and alcohol harmless for her. While she was smoking, something had snuck from behind her in secret. Oh, she said in reply, noticing that her left backside of her jeans was now smeared with some slime. What happened, Debbie? Ignitia said as she returned. Someone just grabbed my flank. Who did that? She yelled at the river. She then walked a dozen steps away from the river. What are you trying to do, Ignisha asked. Getting some payback, she replied to her. Debbie then made a running start, jumped high into the air, and landed on something in the water. She then wrestled with that something until she threw it onto a black PD van. It turned out to be a prehistoric fishman. Debbie then sprinted and nailed him onto the side of the van. Who are you, and why did you do that, she yelled as she threatened to punch him. I had decided to call myself Gilface. I lived in this river for a long time, centuries even, and I kept my presence a secret until you came along. I just wanted to try something new. Denshirni, don't hurt him, Ebony said to Debbie. He didn't know what he did was wrong. Just give him a second chance. Debbie then decided to slap Gilface instead of punching him. You should always think twice before ever grabbing a woman, especially if she's not even human and she took him onto a black PD helicopter in order to transfer him back to base. After a month, Gilface was put into a large water tank for him to reside, along with having a specialized air pump to keep him from suffering from his sleep apnea. Unfortunately, Dr. Trevors knew that she'll die sooner or later. While she was walking around in, uh, alone in the outskirts of town, she noticed that Mars was pixely transported into her presence. Who are you? she asked her. I am Mars, or Marissa. I am the ruler of the planet Mars, which is recently having an overpopulation problem. And in order to stop it, we have to transform your planet into an environment more suitable for our kind. Betty then told her, You can't steal planets, Marissa. If you change this planet into another Mars, then what would become for mankind? 
Don't you care for us humans? And she answered, It is not in my coordinates to surrender, Trevors. I do what is best for the Martians, no matter how much bloodshed involves. Dr. Trevors then says, Kill me then. I know I'll die soon, especially if you're lacking in compassion. Mars said, then says, So be it. Rest in peace, as you'd say. She then made a nuclear ball from her bionic arm's palm and blasted it onto the doctor, leaving a dissolved hole where her heart was, and Dr. Trevors fell to the ground dead. When the news broke out about Dr. B about Betty's murder, Denstrini, Ignisha, Gilface, and all the workers of the PD went to her funeral in Washington, D.C., and for the first time in her life, Debbie cried about the passing of her adopted mother. Two months later, Denstrini and her allies were called to Tokyo, where they heard that Betty's murderer was running rampant across a local bullet train station. While there, they were chasing and battling Marisa, and during the fight, a young Japanese girl got her leg caught to the rail of an oncoming bullet train. Luckily, before the train ran her over, Denstrini stepped in front of her and did an uppercut onto the train, completely knocking it off of its tracks. She then turned to the girl and broke the fourth wall by saying, Don't worry, kid. Those people on the train are extras for this story, so you don't have to worry about them. When Denstrini and her partners tracked down Mars again, this time in the New York Harbor, Debian and, and Ignitia were battling a swarm of Martian soldiers. Gilface was trying to go solo in his fight against Marissa, though he was struggling to make it through. Luckily, Right before she killed Gilface with a nuclear blast, Denstrini sprinted through the commotion and punched Mars into the sky, knocking her out of sight. Welcome to Earth, Marissa, Debbie said. Back in the HQ, Gilface visited Debbie's quarters and said, Debbie, I could never comprehend the fact that you saved my life. I don't want to alarm you, but I've got to admit, for the first time I've actually fallen in love with you. Okay, Denstrini replied in surprise, and from that point on, she and Gilface were in a pending relationship. Three weeks later, it was revealed that Denstrini was elected by the entire U.S. to be the new CEO of the Paranormal Defense in her adopted mother's honor. Meanwhile, we then start seeing Mars after landing on the beaches of a recently unidentified island. And as a source of foreshadowing, Marissa started getting up in order to get some payback and to annihilate not just mankind, but Denstrini as well. The end. Well, guys, I hope you guys have enjoyed the storyline. I, I tried all I can to keep it in proper sequencing for you guys to keep up with and such. I hope you guys enjoyed this footage, and um, if you'd like to see more, just um, it will be fine if you uh, like, um, subscribe, and comment down below. It's your choice. And until next time, I'm Leviathan. Hope you guys have a fine time and such. Until next time, in transmission.